This podcast is sponsored by A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London and Middlesex, both family owned and operated. By Hyde Park Care Pharmacy. Experience the difference an independent pharmacy can make for you and your loved ones. Hyde Park Care Pharmacy offers personalized care, short wait time, very competitive pricing, easy transfer of your prescription, and much more. And by Molly Maid. During these times of COVID-19, it has never been more important to keep your family safe. With the healthy home cleaning system, Molly Maid London is here to help. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. Today, we are excited to release this book launch special. We welcome best-selling author Kate Bowler as we celebrate with her today's release of No Cure for Being Human and Other Truths I Need to Hear. In this episode, we explore the notion of assurances of a life that is good, better, best, and what happens when the life you hope for is put on hold indefinitely. Kate Bowler believed that life was a series of unlimited choices until she discovered, at age 35, that her body was racked with cancer. In No Cure for Being Human, she searches for a way forward as she mines the wisdom and absurdity of today's best life now advice industry, which insists on exhausting positivity and on trying to convince us that we can out-eat, out-learn, and outperform our humanness. We are, she finds, as fragile as the day we were born. Get set to laugh and have a tissue in case you cry. Let's celebrate the launch of No Cure for Being Human. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you may be tuned in. We welcome you back to another edition of the Vickers Crossing podcast. The Vickers Crossing is a virtual space where faith intersects with the public square. And we're glad to be back with you today. I'm Rob Henderson from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's Anglican Church in London. I'm Kevin George from St. Aidan's Anglican Church in the northwest of London. Good to be with you again, Robbie. My name is Ian. I'm a producer, singer, songwriter, editor, and the person that is is getting this out to your ears. You're the right. man. You're the man. We, we are the hosts today at the Vickers Crossing, and we have a very special guest that we have been so looking forward to uh, talking to today. Um, we're going to be welcoming um, a uh, person that is originally from Canada, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, and has, has made the trip down and lives in the States now. So we're going to be welcoming her back. Uh, through the Vickers Crossing, and we're going to talk about her new book, which is called No Cure for Being Human and Other Truths I Need to Hear. Historian, professor, bestselling author, and Canadian Kate Bowler is here today. And that's the, the book, and that's the poster. So there you go. And this is coming out very shortly. So we're looking today, the day you're today. listening to this. Oh, right, right. That's right. We do record these a little earlier, don't we? <laughs> yeah. I gave up the. I gave up the ghost. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. We'll break the fifth dimension and we'll just let you know. The that fifth this is, dimension? Or is it the fourth dimension? Whatever it is. I don't know. But a book is being launched on this day. The day this on this day you're this hearing us speak. Yeah. Yes. The yes. Book launch Perfect. special. Okay. So Kate's going to join us in a minute. But first, uh, Kevin's going to do our land acknowledgement. Sure. Uh, we want to acknowledge that the Vickers Crossing is recorded on the traditional lands of the Anandashabek, Haudenosaunee. Lena Payawak and Attawandaran peoples on the lands connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. This land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous people, including First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, who we uh, recognize to be contemporary stewards of the land and contributors in a vital way to our society and people with whom we wish to work towards reconciliation. Okay, thank you. And a big thank you to our sponsors, as, all, as always, here on the Vickers Crossing, first to A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family-owned and operated, and our good buddy Dave Mullen, a great partner here at the Vickers Crossing. So hello to Dave and everybody today at A. Miller George Funeral Home. Yes, and to Carol Basada of Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, locally operated, locally owned, locally loved. Get your drugs at Hyde Park Care Pharmacy today. Mention Rebby Kevy, get a 10% discount. And last but certainly not least, a big thank you to Molly Maid. Make your home a healthy haven call Molly Maid London today. Trisla Trisha Lister, the wonderful human being, hooked us up with that one. So many thanks over there. Uh, if you want something cleaned, Molly Maid. Holla, holla, holla. 
<laughs> Give her a holla. <laughs> Give her a holla. Give her a holla. Yeah. All right, guys, we got some, uh, I have to point out too that Kate's joining us in a few minutes, but we got our Canadian garb on. I'm a bit out of shot here, but I got my my Canadian hockey jersey. Kevin's got his wearing, Canadian Ian? jersey. Ian. I got a root sweater getting, with the Canadian. The, yeah, very Heck good. Yeah. Very we good, feel so. that any woman from Winnipeg living in North Carolina will probably need a little bit of home looking stuff when she comes i think on. so i yeah. think so yeah did anybody get a tim hortons oh yeah I, I have one going actually okay good, good. sure to get and, oh, i'll make sure and if we get get the cup up and if we can get ian singing a little burton cummings later that'll oh, really yeah. make her feel it stopping tom connor's i got you uh, okay oh, yeah. <laughs> um but before kate joins us uh kevin it's time for everybody's favorite segment here in the vicar's crossing who in the world did we book this week oh Funny you should ask, Rob. Drum roll, please. Oh, jeez. Elizabeth, I'm coming to join you. <laughs> All right. That's well, I'm glad me. you asked. This week, we booked, Rob, we booked a uh, scholar, activist, profess professor, speaker, author, Miguel De La Torre. Here he is. All right. There he is. Very good. And uh, we'll be having him on on December 1st. Um, his uh, new book uh, just recently released is called Decolonizing Christianity, Nice, uh, which is a fantastic book. It's Becoming Badass Believers is his subtitle. So right. this is the sort of guy we need on here, a badass believer. You need uh, more badasses on the podcast. We do. I read his book, which was called Embracing Hopelessness. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought it was a manual for working for the Anglican Church, so I picked it up and read it, and, <laughs> and uh, it was fantastic. It, it it was not; it's much deeper than that. But I right. uh, look forward to seeing Miguel de la Torre right here on the Vicar's Cross. Good, good. So I know we've got some uh, great shows lined up for you over the next couple of months, folks. So stick with us, and we're glad you're here today. Um, and we're glad that Kate Bowler is here today to talk about her new book right here. So we're going to invite Kate into the Zoom room and chat a bit more on the Vickers oh, Crossing. Canada. And we are back on the Vickers Crossing and so, so happy today. Kevin, you and I are rarely uh, uh, tickled, but today we're tickled. <laughs> we're tickled. We're tickled I, today. I feel because tickled all Kate, over. Because Kate Bowler is here with yes. us yes. at the Vickers Crossing. <laughs> Welcome, Hi, home, Kate. Kate. Welcome home, Kate. Welcome home. Welcome home. <laughs> gentlemen i could not be happier to be anywhere yes, than right. with two than with with friends with a with a with a Timmy hortons mug and just a lot of just a lot of powerful canadian sportswear and uh <laughs> right. no no we're, winnipeg jets we're wrapping, we're but wrapping. We, <laughs> well i was gonna wear my montreal canadians gear but i figured you're a jets mm -hmm. fan so yeah, i didn't want to get into that thank you it's uh it's all winnipeg jets and unfortunately saskatchewan rough riders for mm -hmm. for really? football and I, I thought you were a bombers fan you know i my parents are from saskatchewan so uh, i have to okay. i have to wrap okay. hard yeah. That's cool. My son was actually at a Saskatchewan game last week because he and a buddy drove from Ontario. We're in London, Ontario to yeah. Jasper, Alberta. They went on a 10 day cross country trek, two guys, and they stopped in Saskatchewan and caught a football game. Well, pretty cool. I just feel cool. so good that we get to bring you back. Like, what are you missing? Is there something that we could have gotten for you that you're missing? Like, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, I always miss, um, well, see the thing, the things that I miss are, uh, Applebee's always has honey dill. It Ooh. doesn't have it in the Applebee's in the States. That no, always really? makes okay. me sad. Oh. Just a solid, a lot of solid bison burgers. A yeah. lot of, you know, yeah. what I <laughs> miss is that my brother-in-law who's a hunter yeah. is always offering me Ziploc bags of treats and I'm oh. putting tweets in air quotes, which of course podcasts are a very <laughs> yeah, visual yeah, medium. Yeah. So that really yeah, works, but, yeah. uh, and it always has like some of the fancier nuts and some M&Ms and stuff. And it turns out it is always, and I mean, 100% of the time I'm halfway through and it turns out it's, it's bear bait. It's oh, all oh my God. bear bait. I always find it in the, in the garage in a barrel that just says see, unconsumable, not safe yeah, for human consumption. Yeah, see, yeah. I thought where you were going was with jerky and stuff, right? Because, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. Being from Newfoundland, my crowd are always making like all kinds of moose meat stuff, right? So I always yeah. get that when I go home. So yeah, no, well, our, buddy, out trying to our kill buddy, me. our buddy Ian here, uh, who had to step out for a minute, he'll be back. Um, he's a singer songwriter. Yeah. And he, we were going to have him sing a little Celine Dion to make you feel at home too. So, oh, uh, you know, but we'll, maybe we'll work on that a little bit. Maybe, <laughs> I, they he finish. Say, they finish. I, I have to pick up for Ian because he's not here, but Ian said, actually, he preferred to sing Stomp and Tom. 
Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I did. Um, I did go on a little, um, like a little go to the coast, uh, go out in a boat, uh, time a couple of weeks ago. And it turns yeah. out all the sort of amateur pirates in the, on the North Carolina coastline are all into, um, Canadian maritime, of course, like sea ditties. So it's yeah. a lot of, mm-hmm. it's a lot of just great big sea just works its way as the classic that That's works awesome. its way yeah. around. And it's perfect. Yeah. Alan Doyle. That's great. Oh, yeah. Alan Doyle. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. We are so thrilled to have you here and we've been talking about this to so many people that you were coming on the show and we're so happy to talk about the new book which is coming out yeah. today yeah. today's the day it is. no <laughs> cure for being human <laughs> and so awesome we're, we're so excited to talk to you about this and i think kevin's gonna kind of just start things off and we'll, yeah. we'll chat about i mean i feel book. like all this laughter we've been having about canada and all that stuff i have to pick up a book and i was i just listened to your recent podcast with the guy from uh, arrested development what is his yes. name hale tony tony hale, tony hale mm. yeah. yeah and i yeah. uh, just listened to it uh, the other day and and my my favorite part is when you say to him you're worried about the publishers and your titles because we're going from all this laughter to no cure for being human <laughs> yeah, yeah. hey guys no cure not even a little for our mortality <laughs> so, yeah. it's good to lean in in a moment oh, like yeah. that we're all yeah. gonna die yeah. yeah it's always me at a childhood birthday party just telling those uncomfortable truths <laughs> Yeah, she's the mother over there reminding everybody that you're all gonna die. They yeah. may be they may be celebrating their sixth birthday, but it's all coming to an end eventually. Yeah. Hey little Madison. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Count Bad start counting now. <laughs> Countdown uh, begins. Candles while you can. Oh Lord. Well, look, so from from all that laughter to this very serious subject, which is the incredible uh, journey that you've been on with cancer. You begin this book with with a scene of you in the hospital uh, being delivered the news that you have stage four colon cancer. Um, and many people have been there. Many have been in that very uncomfortable place. Um, it's a horrible spot. Your account is very raw. It's very honest and very compelling. I mean, I really felt drawn into it. it, it mm. Thank you for your vulnerability in it. Mm. Um, so often there's something also, and, and you identify this in, in the way you recount this, something so clinical and, and sterile about the whole thing, you know, and they use these euphemistic words like lesions and, and yeah. colon transverse colon masses. <laughs> I feel like I've had a couple of those myself just before 10 this morning, but, <laughs> but, but there's all this stuff. And it's like, what is that? What yeah. the hell is that? And you, you have to, I mean, it's incredible. I can imagine just listening to you, uh, you being in that bed and, 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 commanding the attention of the doctor to actually speak English and, yeah. and tell you what's going on. So as much as we imagine life as a series of choices, and we all at some point have to come, we all must at some point uh, come to grips with the fact uh, that we're all human. And uh, your book calls out the lie that things are always getting uh, big, better, best, I think is how you refer to it. And yeah. uh, it really teases out the question around what happens when we face the realization that much of life is the messy and crappy stuff that we can't change, that it can't be fixed. So what then? Um, And this episode that you recount in the beginning of the book, you're, you're 35 years old, you're on an upward trajectory. You got this great Canadian husband and this beautiful little boy that you just had. Right. And you've, you've, you've written your book blessed, which I love the title blessed. And, uh, and, (laughs) which by the way, if you haven't read it, folks, get it and read it. It's in that context where everything is cooking. It's like you're cooking with gas. It's like up here in the rural areas. Oh, geez, she was cooking with gas, eh? It's too bad. She had everything going for her, eh? Oh, my God. Yes. Everything was perfect, eh? She was really cooking with gas. And <laughs> so, yes. so you, life had really told stuff. me to give her. As yeah, give said. her, man. Like, yeah. you know, flatten her out, man. Don't let up, eh? So, and so she was doing all that. And it's in that context that the guy says to you in plain English, once you demand it, you got stage four cancer. Yeah. And you're sitting there doing the math on what he's telling you. You got 730 days, basically, is what they're giving you. Yeah. Um, suddenly, you're a ticking clock. You said that what you thought uh, were moments were actually minutes. What What did you mean by that? And can you say a little more about that episode? I guess in the until then, and maybe part of it is just the arrogance of youth, and maybe it was the the sort of high of endless hustle that I had. I mean, I had really organized my life around just always getting somewhere else. Like I was always the kid 
crying outside of her, you know, locker outside of math class, weeping, <laughs> just weeping mm. over a B minus, like positive yeah. that that would be. <laughs> I'll just, I'll never forget my math teacher, Mr. Booth, leaning his head out the classroom window and seeing me crying and going, a B minus isn't the death of your dreams, Bowler. Yeah, that's and true. I was like, <laughs> but like, that was always the, everything always felt like it was adding up to something. Right. And then when some, suddenly it went from a math of endless addition to a very different equation. Right. And all of a sudden I, I, I felt just almost claustrophobic mm. by the calendar that, that every, everything that I would do would likely be the last time I would do it. I remember the second mm. I was wheeled out of the hospital and I looked at the leaves and I thought, oh, it's, this is going to, there's going to be a crisp in the air and this will be my last fall. Mm, and wow. I had never really imagined that things were finite before countable. Mm. And I, I, so trying to um, reimagine time um, in that way, it really, it, it felt impossible. It felt like my brain was breaking against that kind of math. Mm. Mm. Yes, I, I have to tell you, by the way, I once cried when I got a B minus on a math test too, but it was tears of joy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We don't have the same uh, achieving thing going on here at You're all. Like, and so I turn to the Lord, <laughs> right. the Lord whose cosmic math makes Lord, up for one, all. Lord, one day I'll be a vicar. Could you please at least <laughs> let me understand yeah. the church budget? Well, yeah, just, just tithing probably just, helps. Yeah, just, I mean, what, how much is 10% again? Anyway, uh, <laughs> I, I really think though, like, I mean, it's, it's just really something that uh, we don't think about things in those uh, in, in that way, in terms of quantifying time like that, like yeah. I, I just was really taken when you read in the book that he tells you, you know, two years and your immediate response is 730 days. And then you turn to thoughts around Zach, your boy and, and, yeah. and your husband, like that's really, um, yeah. and I think I hear this a lot. I know Rob has as well, you know, in our pastoral role, when people mm -hmm. get those diagnoses, it's really tough because, you know, all of a sudden, all the shit that happened before, yeah. yeah. As you talk about it in the before time, Kate, yeah. it, it, yeah. it doesn't seem so critical anymore. Yeah. 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 And I, and I think that some parts of being a person just feel Im, Im, <laughs> like it, it makes those thoughts impossible. Like I know looking at my son and kids are just kind of the language of the future. You're always trying to figure out when they're a baby, like what percentile is your enormous head? And <laughs> are you growing at the rate you're supposed to be growing? Yeah. And then yeah. you're just lining them up against the door frame and trying to, you know, and trying to track their height. And then you're, then they're growing out of every sleeper you've gotten from a friend and every bit of them seems to tell you about tomorrow. Right. But when suddenly you're counting your tomorrows, it's, it's just very hard to hold, hold that kind of time all in one like in in both hands right mm -hmm. yeah yeah I, I, oh sorry go ahead Kate no I guess <clears throat> yeah I guess there's just certain kinds of love I think that make that sort of math not possible mm. see I think that that's why I wasn't interested in math I'm more interested in love it's because <laughs> some math yeah. is just not possible um <laughs> You know, you're, you are, to me, you're the go-to expert on the prosperity gospel. Like, uh, when, whenever anybody gets into this with me, I say, look, go read Blessed. It's a great book. <laughs> and uh, because uh, you've studied it, you've, you've, you've delved into it, and you've done the work. Uh, it's required reading, in my mind. People like Joel Olstein have unleashed phrases like, your best life now, yeah, uh, yes. which, which probably didn't sound, doesn't sound very good when a doctor just tells you you got 730 days to live. Yeah. Um, you know, like that, that sort of rubs the wrong way. And there's a whole wellness industry that's, that's sort of uh, been the natural outflow of all that in a, in a consumeristic society that we live in, right? So it's like, you know, you, you go, I, you, you describe a great scene in the book of you being in the gift shop. Oh my gosh, hospital. I lost my mind. Oh, that was awesome. <laughs> so, so she's yanking books out, folks. She's, yeah. she's tearing out all these prosperity preachers and yeah. she's yelling at the manager to get the shit out of the store. <laughs> she did shit, that's my paraphrase, but, but she's telling people. Well, I've been very... Uh been very non-judgmental until that time you know i wrote such a, <laughs> yeah. wrote such a nice a nice history of yeah. like what makes it compelling and then mm. all of a sudden i remember just looking at the bookstore manager and i'm like wearing a hospital gown and i'm holding <laughs> my little iv oh yeah and i was like you can't sell this to me That's right. like i said it was so much yeah. menace my <laughs> sweet little sweet little manitoban voice That's right, yeah. and i i just I guess like the, 
it all, the, the, the idea that we're constantly supposed to be improving, mm-hmm. it feels wonderful in some seasons of our life. Like there's wind in our sails and everything is moving. But then, then when you know that you're the person who can't possibly pick themselves back up again, I, uh, I really started to take it personally when people right. made someone like me and like all of us, I think just not just feel like, like, um, not just, not just feel like life had failed us, but that right. we'd failed somehow. Yeah, well, and I think it, life, yeah. it leads yeah. to a devastating feeling, right? Like if you've bought into that and, and you're in that hospital bed or, or you've been told your child is going to die or any number of things that many of us have faced in life, yeah. um, you know, it, it really is devastating and disappointing when bad things happen to all people, right? Because they do. We, yeah. we, you know, none of us gets out alive, right? I mean, this is what's going to happen. Um, you write about coming to understand that as freedom. Uh, this is a, a little uh, quote from the book. You write, today will be as ordinary as yesterday, days and weeks working out the consequences of the moments that came before. We like to imagine that we are starring in an extended morality play where lessons are hero never dies. But in fact, we must make do with the fact that there will be weddings and funerals again this year, and everyone will spend most of their evenings watching Netflix. This is a kind of freedom. The only question is, how should we live under the burden of it? Um, So with that in mind, um, I've been turning that phrase over in my mind that you use. This is a kind of freedom. The only question is, how do we live under the burden of it? It's been stuck with me since I read it a couple of weeks ago. It's like freedom as, and and there's this burden of it. Can you say more about that? Yeah. Well, all of our, all of our choices at at first feel like they're some kind of ladder out of whatever we're in, or they're the, it's the open road in front of us. But for the most part, I think, especially if we're doing it right, as we move along, we're actually, there isn't really an open road. Like Mm. we're actually in a web, a web where like everywhere we move, it pulls on another string. And so there's the freedom we have is to just, is to make our choices inside of this, of of the burden of all the choices that came before and the burden of that much love. And Mm. so I, I don't know, I think I just had this, um, and part of it is because we're, especially in the United States and like, I'm a historian of, I really do work in North American religion most of the time, (laughs) but I do, but typically like American flavors are this really thick script of I'm an individual, all my choices are free. I'm characterized by, by my freedom. And I, I think the only freedom I felt was to uh, figure out how to live with the responsibility of the beautiful life I'd been given, but that Mm. responsibility would feel very like painful Mm. from that moment forward. Wow. Um, We lost Ian. For those of you who are watching this, you'll see that Ian magically appeared. For those of you who are listening, you wouldn't have heard (laughs) Ian before now, because right as we were about to record, Ian went to bed. Uh, no, he no, yeah. I, and I never said wet the bed. I said he went to bed. But <laughs> as my new finis, he might sort of be my a new bit. So, but Ian had a mattress delivered in the middle of yeah. a podcast because that's who Such he is. Life. Yeah. Yeah. So, Am- Amazon shows up whenever they show up. Yeah, yeah. Right? Sleep yeah. Country Canada. Give us a cu- <laughs> give us a call, Sleep Country. We got a funeral home <laughs> and we got a pharmacy and we got a cleaner, but we don't have a mattress company, so we'd love to have you. Covering all our bases here. <laughs> Ian, do you have a question? Like are well, you, are you just busy sleeping around? Uh, <laughs> hold on. Sleeping around <laughs> is not my forte. Okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, I do, but first uh, I want to mention that my mom is a huge fan. Um, she she uh, was following your Lenten series for for when you're posting on Instagram. She follows you on Instagram. She's she's a massive fan. Aww, I'm very thanks. excited that we we are recording with you today. So um, we'll yeah. tell her hi. That's well, funny. she should have made sure you didn't order a mattress in the middle of the interview. <laughs> <laughs> if she raised mom. you right, if she raised you right, Ian, I'll tell you. Come if my on, mother, mom. if my mother was here now from Newfoundland, she'd box your ears. Anyway, go on. <laughs> my my mom will not be happy <laughs> about that that interaction right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but you write about bucket lists in your book. You write the problem with an, with aspirational list, of course, is that they often skip the point entirely. Instead of helping us grapple with our fi- uh, finitude, I think that's the right pronunciation of that word. 
um they have approximated infinity which is holy cow that's cool um you go on to say it is much easier to count items than to know what counts you also write about spending time it's an expression we all use rather mindlessly spending time much of spending time much of this memoir and your story wrestles with how you spend your precious time um but time is not as flat as we might assume what different types of time do you do you often encounter and and how how does that sort of relate to who you are yeah I guess I because I really thought of it as just kind of a like it's minutes plus minutes equals days equals yeah, yeah, yeah. and then like in math class exactly I was back this, to my sad this, B minus all this yeah. math is giving me a friggin headache is all Come I got up the math <laughs> <laughs> sorry Kate but I just had to get that in I uh I guess there's I mean, there's, and there's different ways that we imagine the future for, for a long time. I'd always kept these lists that I didn't really think of as a bucket list. And mm -hmm. then it turns out it was just, you know, I, I always wanted to, as, as, as you do, when you live on the prairies, immediately become best friends of Anne of Green Gables. And of then course. I remember when I was applying to college, I really earnestly told my guidance counselor that I wanted to quote, go wherever Anne of Green, <laughs> Green Gables went. <laughs> yeah, you, you can have all the cordial healthy. you want. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And of kindred spirits forever. Um, yeah, I was, uh, uh, you know, and I imagined myself as some kind of budding Egyptologist. And it turns out that kind of time was just dreaming. It was just mm -hmm. a million some days. And I, it some days didn't always have to be, you know, concrete, but it would just, it, it's wonderful to imagine yourself as all these different kinds of people. And, uh, and that when it kind of the horizon narrows to a dot, you realize that you, that, that we, I think in our, in our regular lives, we get, we get stuck kind of imagining ourselves as living this one linear story. Mm. And, uh, I think as Christians though, we get we get to borrow different kinds of time. Hmm. We get the one that's in the present that God still says is good, even though it's unbearably boring most hmm. of the time. And it's, hmm. it's pastoring, taking care of things. It's hmm. paying bills. It's being a traffic. It's resenting your neighbor, which I, which I do. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then, but like, we're given the Christian past. We're given not just a story in general about God's love. We're given like a Judeo-Christian tradition with like, and then God did this. And then the book of Deuteronomy kept happening. And then we're given yeah. like, yeah. we're given like a record in which we're supposed to situate our story. And, and we're also supposed to look back in what's already happened and see the places where God showed up. And every now and then when I'm having like a, a good thought about that, I think, um, oh, thank God that the past is already mine. Right. Like all those beautiful mm -hmm. things, like they, they, like, they, 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 they don't get erased just because the future looks really blurry, yeah. but, but then we're kind of just given, I think a lot of different experiences of, um, like my friend Luke was, was reminding me that there's also tragic time. There's mm -hmm. this, the, the feeling that life is really delicate. And if you talk to anybody who's just gone through something, it's like that song where they're like, why do the birds keep singing? But like, I woke up yeah. again and it felt impossible that anyone could have an ordinary day right. in this when, right. when nothing in my life has, will it's just, um, will ever be the same. And, and then we're, we're given the story about God's future and that feels confusing and hilarious and wonderful. And mm -hmm. like, it's just beyond our ability to even put words to it. And so yeah. I think we're, I think we're really not living a linear story the way we think we are. I think we mm -hmm. just, depending on where we're at in our lives and even in our day, we can actually be experiencing all different kinds of time. I just happen to sort of, you know, have bought a lot of real estate in tragic time. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. overinvested when the market yeah. looks good. And then... Well, you know, <laughs> you, you, it's probably to do with your book titles. You know, <laughs> no cure for yeah. being human. Go buy <laughs> something over here in tragic time. <laughs> oh my gosh, so guys, the number of hysterically bad things that keep happening. I like it's like I just. I know. Um, it, I, when I was recently bitten by a poisonous snake, no, I oh, come no on, way. had to be hospitalized. Come on, for no. a copper head bite. Also because I grew up near the where all the garter snakes come mate every year in Manitoba, right. and I was like, snakes are great. <laughs> it turns out snakes are not great. And uh, but the best part was like it was only you know a couple maybe two months ago, and 
I got to like bust through the doors of the hospital this time, not for cancer and yell, I've been poisoned. <laughs> <laughs> it was so true. It's so dramatic. And I will. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute. There's something in the middle of that that just caught my attention. Are you telling me that Winnipeg is the place on the earth where all the garter snakes go to mate? Did you not know? No, I didn't know. That was not in geography. (laughs) Well, it is a place called Narcissus or Narcissus. I don't know. And uh, it has all this limestone, which has holes in it. And all the garter snakes from basically, it feels like all the world, but that can't possibly be true. Um, When it gets cold, they go there and they go into the warm subterranean rock festival and then they live there and then when they come out they have this absolutely horrifying i'm going to use the word orgy on your podcast horrifying snake orgy and and (laughs) we as elementary school children are brought out to watch (laughs) (laughs) and that's what it's like growing up in manitoba why can't this happen in dildo newfoundland is what i want to know (laughs) like why 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 is it because we we had no snakes in newfoundland but dildo newfoundland should be the place where that's hosted you would think that is you would think one upsetting two exciting to discover that that every 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 province is just who knew who knew we could be so silly over something so serious i apologize kate (laughs) but that's that's what's that's what's so wonderful about reading this book kate that i found over the last couple the last week or so that i was reading it there's you know there is difficult things to to read about but there's also times when i was just laughing out loud and my wife could hear me in the other room you know um and one of one of those great stories was that i wanted to to bring up that i was laughing out loud about your story about the compromise taco (laughs) and so not to give it all away but your friends are you're you're getting together and your friend wants you to have a bite of her peruvian taco so she gets passed (laughs) down a line of people and of course nothing there's nothing better than handling Clear, handing clearly clearly pre-covid oh of course yeah. of course yeah yeah but you know like you got to say there's nothing there's nothing better than handing someone whose immune system is totally compromised <laughs> like a piece of food that had everyone's hands on it yeah yeah just the so sweet wet it, remains yeah. of a right. Peruvian taco. let's give it to kate um <laughs> But it was, but and so I'm laughing at this story, just picturing this image. But it was, but it was also at that party that someone um, learns that you have cancer and says something to you, yeah. um, and they say, you know, you you need to go out with a bang. Since God. you're gonna die, you should really live it up and go out with a bang. <laughs> Oh and God. you know, I was putting that in the yeah the list of things people say. You know, yeah. you know people so things people said. Yeah, we amazing. Have a, we have a bucket here where we put in the stupid things people say. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, but you're right. Th- this is what was neat about that was you write this about that that comment the person made. You said, "I open my mouth to say something clever or frank, but nothing comes out. Frickish. Just a little shake of my head, and I stare at him, and then I make a beeline for the bathroom." To so many people, I am no longer myself. I am the reminder of a thought that is difficult for the rational brain to accept, that our bodies might fail us at any moment. Mm-hmm. And I thought so often, you know, and we've all been in this situation where we've been confronted by someone's pain or suffering, and we internalize it, right? We, we make it all about us in that moment. Yeah. Um, and, and it's maybe a self-defense mechanism because we don't want to face the fact that we are frail and we are mortal human beings. And I wonder if you could share a bit more about maybe your experience of how others experienced you through that lens of it's like you're the sick person, right? Yeah. And what was that like for you to know that they were experiencing that? Yeah, that was such a big shift because mm. before I was just me. And mm. then all of a sudden when I, I, could, I could tell who knew, Mm. And they would, you know, and sometimes it was kind of like sad cocker spaniel face with like uh, the tilt pity. of the head mm-hmm. to the side. And, but church, I mean, especially church, church felt oh, impossible. Yeah. Cause I could, man, the passing of a piece, like I could tell exactly who it was. Yeah. And, and, and then I felt like I was, that was the beginning of a really weird loneliness that I hadn't experienced before where mm. I was a kind of, especially especially for people who had spiritual questions that it was kind of a theological problem to be solved. Mm. Is, there was just sort of questions there and the questions ranged from innocent to kind of fishing to teaching or mm. judging. And it could mm. range from, 
yeah, but was there cancer in your family? It's yeah. like always the first, like, how old were they when they died? As if like, let, let me just decide how sad I should be. It's yeah. the, the, yeah. the answer is an age. It's the sadometer, right? And then, they, they, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and the answer was, you know, it, I could tell because I was immediately becoming, I just developed totally different reflexes. I had this speech called, no, there was no cancer in my family. No, no, it was, it was a huge surprise to me. No, it wasn't something I ate. No, it mm. wasn't. I didn't live oh next gosh. to a, you know, a mattress factory. For example. A snake, <laughs> yeah, snake there goes that endorsement. A, a snake bit. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. <laughs> I, it was hard to, it was hard to, to shift into being this person that um, was, was for a lot of people at the time I was sort of the first bad thing that happened. Mm. And I think we all have stories like that. Oh, do you yeah. remember so-and-so? Yeah. And, uh, and that I always felt that very abstractly until that person was me. Yeah. 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 And yeah, I, I, uh, I, I'm, since then that loneliness has been a kind of long, that's been like a long standing thing is, mm. I don't know. I had a friend the other day say, how can I be there? Like, how can I be a good friend right now? It took me a long time to realize all I really needed was, um, well, just don't, just don't forget. Right. Like just mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. it is, just don't forget. And just please don't, um, and just please don't leave. Yeah. yeah. That's an incredibly, uh, like I just, and, and people who've listened to this podcast and Ian and Rob know, of course, we had a, a couple of my great nieces die with a condition called Batten's disease. They were mm. seven years of age when they, seven and eight when they died and my sister talks about this as her grandmother in the way that you just did about that loneliness and about the how people close to you end up going over here yeah <laughs> and uh, it's not always the people that are furthest away it's sometimes the people that are closest to you because they don't know what to do with this right yes. and it's like i'd like to come alongside of you but it's too hard on me Right. Um, yeah. you know, and I don't know yeah. if you, if you have any reflection, like, like I mean, cause I know, I, I, I just think that it changed us in a family forever. Right. Like, so yeah. particularly like for my nephew and, and his wife who were parents to like, they're constantly looked at as the family in a small community in Newfoundland who had two little girls die. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's who they are now. Right. And I'm sure there are people who look to you and say, well, that's Sarah, you know, cancer. Right. Yeah, that's right. I, I, um, I, cause I'm now I've met so people who are living in the after of their yeah. life. And, um, I think that is a big, I, it's, it then becomes an identity shift where I remember even I was, um, I was interviewing somebody, uh, for the podcast and we were going to talk about his book and his book had some very sad things in it. And you could tell I was teeing up to the first question where I just asked the question, like what happened, like set up the, you know, so that we can, what is the thing? And then we'll talk about what happened and I could just see embrace. And then he said, well, I, you know, but th there's lots of other things. And, and I, I was just like, I recognize that impulse so intensely, right. you know? So I just kind of stopped the podcast. I was like, Hey, just so you know, like I really get yeah. that you weren't, you are not all the things that have happened. And I'm sorry right. to start there. And we right. don't have to start there if you don't want to, but please know we will, we will get to all the other things that who you are, but mm -hmm. it, it does feel like, um, you kind of over this great divide. And for mm -hmm. a lot of people, you can't go back. I think too, it is often the people who love you best that can't truly see how much pain you're in because mm -hmm. they love you. Like, right. because the idea of you being in pain or you having a problem they can't solve feels mm -hmm. genuinely impossible. So right. sometimes I think it is, it is love that makes us have to be delusional to one another. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's so good that you, we can name that too and talk about what that is for folks that um, are in that situation where they, they feel they need to say that th those perfect words and sum it all up in, yeah. in 30 seconds, right. To know that, that you're not, the things that you're going through are not what define you, right. Yeah. Or, or make you, you whole, right. Yeah. That's I just love people. it when people, you know, you can tell by their presence that they are still remembering you. Mm -hmm. And, and there are some people who really thrive in being the crisis person and bless oh, yeah. them. They are yeah. so great. Yeah. And they yeah. always make the meal chain yeah. right. and they're like the, the, your house is on fire, show up with the water person. Mm -hmm. but then there's kind of that other adorable person who just, who doesn't make you pay for the fact that it's still happening to you. Yeah. And I had, for me, it wasn't, I guess, part of the weird, one of the weird sort of 
gifts of this whole season is it wasn't even the people I would have expected would show up. Right. Like one of the people that showed up for me the most was my school librarian, oh, Roger. Really? And oh Roger just, Roger was um, not a man of many words. Roger, I hoped deep down found me funny. I can't tell. I don't know. <laughs> I'll never know. Showed but, up to Roger. Yeah, it was like deep, deep in there. And, uh, and but he was the one who would be like, oh, are you, do you have to fly out to go get cancer care? And um, what, what time do you need to be picked up? And then he yeah. would show up and then he would look at me and say, you don't need to say anything, which I couldn't tell if it was for him or for me. Yeah. But <laughs> I, uh, but, but it Roger, worked. Roger didn't forget. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Roger was there. Good. Um, there's there's another great powerful moment in the book I was going to ask you about too. You share a time where you were questioning whether or not to continue doing some writing and researching. You had started a project before your diagnosis and you're kind of wondering aloud to a friend and debating about, you know, doing all the work needed because you've only, you know, got about eight months or so. And, and you know, what would be the point in spending time on something like research and writing and work and all that when there are other priorities like like your son? And you say this to your friend, but what if I die this summer and I'm pouring out the coldest words now dug from the bottom of the well, my final moments on the planet will be spent writing a stupid historical book that no one will read all for a job I can't keep. And when I should have spent every precious minute with my son who won't remember me anyway, mm, my heart, my, yeah, my voice shaking, just reading it again. Um, but I have to say like my response to that in the moment probably would have been to totally agree with you because, because, you know, <laughs> right? like, I read your book, exactly. they are stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. but, but it makes sense. Like who, who wouldn't want to set aside work to spend every second with those yeah. that are, they love. Right. Um, but the answer you get back from this friend is, is incredibly poignant because he says, Kate, if the worst happens and this book is the last thing you ever do your son can still find you there. You're in there, Kate, write the book. Like, man, that was powerful. And so I'm just wondering that conversation kind of give you a new perspective on, on what really is the sanctity of what we do, right? Yeah. Our, our work is, is, is holy and, and, and gives to others through our work and our lives. And um, so what was that conversation like? And, and as far as you were to understand what you were doing? Yeah, because it wasn't even a, like a, a book that many people would read. I was writing mm -hmm. a very specific book about the history of women in ministry. Mm -hmm. And I had this, I thought, very interesting historical argument. But mm -hmm. I knew that it would go on and, and like 500 people would read it. Mm -hmm. And and I guess that was part of the, well, if it's not for anyone, if it's not for anything else except the value of the thing itself, mm -hmm. it can our work be a gift? Can it be a calling? Can mm -hmm. it be the ministry because the ministry is who we are? And that happens to be like, you know, I, God has given me the very weird specific gift to write and research very long form specific books with a lot of footnotes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that is you do it very a, well, a quote gift to too many people. <laughs> but I, uh, it gave me a sense that there is, you know, there is work and there is jobs and there is, and then there is the expression of it as, as the, as the light that can shine through us. And right. Right. there's, there's, there's dignity in it. You know, mm -hmm. there's the, like, there was the getting up and having something lovely to do that wasn't just mm -hmm. having cancer. Mm -hmm. There was the feeling that I was still for something mm -hmm. uh, when, when cancer has a way of making you feel really useless. Yeah. And yeah. I guess it kind of affirmed in me that we all just have these, what, whatever the gift is, mm -hmm. it is, it is ours to give. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, yeah. and there's nothing that like, and we won't be erased right. regardless of, of, I, I, I remember kept, I kept saying to myself, you know what, just in this, I won't be eclipsed by the things I didn't choose. Right. So like, yeah. right. just let me yeah. have this. Right. And that, that's a great gift for people that are going to read this book and maybe listening today, they're asking that same question you're asking in the midst of whatever their personal challenges or suffering is. And they're asking like, what's the point in me just getting up and making yeah. coffee and watching Netflix today and you know, whatever, but like, yeah. what's the point in all this? Yeah. Um, and there are little, there are so many little points to this. Like, 
I read a beautiful story about a guy who was just in so much grief with his wife dying that he made a birdhouse and then mm. he made another birdhouse and then he gave mm. them away. And then he started remembering how to watch the birds that live mm. there and see the goodness of his own life. And mm. it, you know, sometimes we just get a birdhouse worth of work to do yep. and that yep. can be a beautiful thing. That, and that's enough. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's enough. I just actually, yeah, I agree, Rob. I'm just thinking of, like, I can't help but as I listen to you, Kate, think of a couple people I know in this very minute uh, who are going through a very similar set of circumstances that you have been through and, you know, have to make decisions about going to work or, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, doing the next research project or whatever. And I just know how meaningful those words of yours are. Um, and it's why what you're doing is so critically important. What a gift you, you speak a gift. I have to tell you, the real gift is your vulnerability and, mm -hmm. and your willingness to be honest about these things and talk about them openly. I think a lot of people, when they get these diagnoses or whatever, they turn into themselves yeah. and, and they never share this stuff. Right. And then everybody assumes that they're the only person dealing with this. Yeah. Uh, when in fact, it's so much pressure too. I mean, it's like that I, that's so much pressure to be the grateful patient yeah, to be yeah. like the one that keeps it together the one that hides how embarrassed they are that now they're the thing that happens to everyone else like right. disease divorce yeah. i mean any kind of suffering it consumes not just you but everyone around you and sometimes mm -hmm. just the shame of that yeah. makes it feel like um like you should really like hide the cost i think i just i'm hoping if especially as as people of faith, we can be more and more honest without seeming quote negative. Right. Unquote. Yeah. yeah. I would, I would just love that. Yeah. Cause yeah. our authenticity is about is from where we suffer. That's where we're authentic. It's not the, Oh, I'm fine. Everything's going to be good. It's a nice day. It's, yeah. it's in the guts of where we live every day. And if we're authentic yeah. and can share yeah. that with each other, especially as people of faith, that's transformative. I, I love what you did. You just say the guts of it the guts of the that life was a we great live every day yeah way to put yeah. it I and i that. i i feel like we've we have a story like that somewhere in scripture right <laughs> it's weird oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He came That's, back yeah. and then he did that <laughs> other a, thing but you know he constantly was going to the guts of the mess of it really i right. mean like yeah. i mean we're following the way of jesus who's whose whole life forget about uh, if we if you want to talk about passion death and resurrection but his very witness was to go to the very messy dirty mm -hmm. unfixable places and yes. and weep and yes. and be present mm -hmm. and you know I, I you know i often say you know that people talk about you know jesus touching the leper and the leper was healed and i always say to people if you've if you've sat on a street corner yelling unclean for 15 years and nobody's ever come near you and all of a sudden a human being comes up and puts his hands on you uh yeah. that's a pretty healing moment you might want to turn it into super jesus but yeah. i want to i want to take it down to the humanity and say look at what's happening here. Somebody's doing mm -hmm. something very human. Someone's being a Roger, right? Someone's yeah. being a Roger yeah. and saying, yeah. what time do you need to be? I'll, I'll pick you up from the airport. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. That's I, love, I, these little ordinary miracles we get to be in other people's lives is yeah. like, that is a, um, cause most of the ways in which we just need comfort are very ordinary. Like right, right now, especially coming out of the pandemic, everyone is uh, unbearably lonely and embarrassed mm -hmm. about that. That's right. not sure who their relationships mm -hmm. are and embarrassed about and that. Embarrassed about Having mental health issues and embarrassed about and that. Embarrassed. Like right. yeah. it is hard to be, uh, it is, it is really hard to be not put together now, especially when we feel so much urgency to That's always right. make the most of things and make yeah. up for lost time. You, you mentioned ordinary miracles. Your friend Sarah Bessie's book, Miracles and Other Reasonable Things. We have a book study on tonight uh, here at St. Oh, Aidan's. Actually, so we're, nice. we're talking about that. Yeah, yeah. Your, oh. your, your book's coming up next. So, oh, it's uh, going to be so. bring depression to the masses. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> you, you know what? You want, your frig, you want your friggin' miracles <laughs> you, with you, Sarah yeah. Bessie? You think I'm you gonna... feel sad? She feels sad. <laughs> we yeah, feel sad. We all feel sad. <laughs> so we're, who's the saddest among <laughs> us all? <laughs> <laughs> I would love a sad book club. Well, do you, I, do you know what came out of our book study last week? Cause we just did the introduction, right. Just to sort of let people know. Yeah. And, and because there was a car accident involved, as you know, just a brief little bit about Sarah's book. And the one guy said, um, you know, I gotta say, uh, I, I read the introduction of this book and I was expecting a big deal. And uh, like she goes in the hospital and she's all like, you know, in a brace and everything. And, uh, and then she goes home the same day. 
And he's like, you know, and I'm like, oh, shit, too bad, eh? For You were expecting more blood and guts, I guess. Like, it's, she just wasn't miserable enough for him. Like, it's just, <laughs> there wasn't enough damage. So for him, I'm going to say, well, let me tell you, you about Kate Bowler. Let me tell you about Kate Bowler. You She's even, sad? even been bitten by snakes. And I got stuff to tell you about Kate Bowler. I could, I'll just send you a short list of miseries. <laughs> It's gonna be nice. I'm or, also I'll read them on Sunday. Yeah. Just a little surprised that um that 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 none of you have brought up the incredible splendor of the Canadian nurses, which have been so, such a Amazing. part of my life. Mm -hmm. Please know that whenever something really surgical was about to happen, there was usually a a, a mostly from Newfoundland medical team there. Well, that was gonna be my next question. Tell oh, me about really? Pat tell me about Patrick. I have a question here about apocalypse, but but nothing is more important than a Newfoundlander. So tell me about Patrick. <laughs> I went into um I was trying to figure out how well I don't know if I should imagine that I'll have I don't know if I should anticipate that I'll have cancer forever. And I had this um port, this little plastic a medical device that was inserted in my chest. And it's just like, it's, it looks like plastic under your skin because mm -hmm. it is plastic under your skin. And it was just, it was such a visual reminder that I was like never done with cancer. And I thought, you know what, now is the time we've got, now is a good health time to take it out. And so I, I went in and you can see it from right under my skin. And this guy is doing my intake form, but he looks like a, just like a human barrel with eyes. <laughs> and, and he was like, and they always ask you like the consent questions. You're like, why are you, you know, ma'am, why are you here today? And I was like, well, I'm here to get this port surgically uh, removed. Or I suppose you could just tear it out with your bare hands. <laughs> and then he looks up, puts down the pen, bursts out laughing. And then, uh, and that was it. That was a friendship that, that, that lasted at least the rest of the day. He let yeah. me take my own slippers to the back. He explained to me the unpardonable sin of dipsy doodling in his inner, in his yeah. hockey league, yeah. which yeah. I, he, um, he told me how many people he'd punched yeah. and um, <laughs> I had such a, and then he invited all the other Canadian nurses from the rest of the hospital to come meet me, which oh was my gosh. absolutely adorable. But my well, favorite part yeah. about him was he uh, was he knew how scared I was mm. and he let me he let me play it through mm -hmm. where I just kept um, doing this sort of like aggressive small talk where I kept saying, where are you from? Even though I was like completely under <laughs> by the time I was like I, in, within this inside the surgery and I could still hear my like dream voice. And I was like, where are you from? <laughs> Which he still answered again and again. And then um, and what was, it was just, uh, it was, it was such a gift of someone that knew I was, I was really having a hard time letting go. It's fair to say there is a Newfoundlander everywhere. <laughs> and so, and so when I read your book and you was Patrick and then all of a sudden out comes Newfoundland, I'm like, oh, of course, there now is. this all is this. I knew there had to be one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I wish I had a chance to meet Patrick. If uh, find out where he's from, we could be related. Yeah. He's being rolled around somewhere just oh, yeah. barrel like through the <laughs> halls of Duke university <laughs> hospital. Yeah. We'll go to Robbie. Yep. Um, so just, we're coming down to our last few minutes here together, Kate. So uh, your reflections on the pandemic and how it has changed lives the world over are really honest and really profound. Um, and, and you especially point out that for many middle-class Americans, um, Canadians too, there are silver linings everywhere, um, yeah. but that agency was not really there for everyone. And a lot of people have suffered more than others, quite frankly, during the last year and a half. Yeah. Um, COVID has brought us all to our knees in many different ways. And even those who felt invincible before have experienced new limitations. What does your memoir offer people for, for whom maybe their life has been upended? Hmm. And I think here, not just about the middle class, but, but all of those who have had some real difficult and, and, and difficult suffering right now, what are you hoping that they can, can take from, from your memoir here? I guess it was something I kind of thought about when I, I visited this little um, chapel on the outskirts of uh, the Grand Canyon. I was on this little road trip and I saw this tiny little baby chapel and I love little, I love giant statues and I love <laughs> tiny things. Mm. And so I, I pulled over and, um, and went inside and saw that the entire inside of the church was covered in graffiti and little notes where people had written mm. their prayers. And their mm. prayers were entirely the kinds of cries we've had throughout the pandemic, which is um, 
will this be okay? God, and then, and then beautiful specific names, like, do you see me down here? Mm. Will my daughter, will my daughter ever come home? Will, will, will this relationship ever be restored? And I think it, it reminded me that, that a life of faith is one that demands so much courage, Mm. like to, to see the world as it really is, to be, to be honest about the things that have been taken and can't be undone. And I'm, I, I hope that the pandemic has cured us of some of our politeness mm. around the things that, that take our lives down to the studs. And also one of the most beautiful things about the crying out was that it is done out of sheer beautiful hope mm. that like we are, we, are, we are calling to a God who must answer, who must answer with love mm-hmm. in the in the salvation of the world Mm -hmm. and also in the community that we're given to actually rally around each other and like pick each other up. So I just really hope that people give themselves permission to be as delicate as we really are to like Mm -hmm. put down some of the, I'm invincible. I have to fix my own life and like lean into that beautiful interdependence for which we are made. Cause you know, man, if we're made for for more indestructibility, you'd think like skin would be thicker, eyes would be sharper. <laughs> None right. of us would endlessly yeah. have vision yeah. loss. Yeah, That's more right. than two sets of teeth, please. Yeah. Why, you know, why am I like, falling apart, right? Why am so I falling like, apart? <laughs> more than two sets of teeth. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. I know my son's, you know, teeth are falling out. I'm like, oh, but I'm so sorry. Bones fall out of your head. Yeah. This, this yeah. whole ride, yeah. this whole human ride is really And real. if he gets into hockey, he may need that third set. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's a thing. So listen, to just to sort of wrap things up a little bit, I guess I, I get, I, I, as I was just listening to you now, I'm thinking there's that silly uh, Joel Olstein. You're going to live your best life now. You know, my favorite Joel Olstein thing was I'm dry. I was on vacation. And so I have no reason to ever hear Joel Olstein. Yeah. Olstein ever because i would never turn it on but i'm in the hotel room and i flick the tv on there he is with his pearly whites all shining and he tells this story he goes i was driving down the interstate and <laughs> this is good yeah that's a really said, good accent yeah, <laughs> and he says i i was thinking about how i was living my best life now and i was stressing because i had lost my wedding band do you know how much I love my wife? I love my oh. wife so much and I had lost my wedding band and I was, I was verklempt and I didn't know <laughs> what I would do. And I got pulled over by a state trooper who pulled me aside. And when he came up, he looked and he said, Hey, you're the preacher man, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. He said, well, preacher man, you can't drive that fast. And I thought, Lord Jesus, why are you giving me a ticket now? I'm a, and then I reached over to get my, driver's license and i opened the glove box and out fell my wedding band god oh. delivered my oh. wedding band in that moment <laughs> this Miracles. is not, yep. nuts nuts yeah. so yeah. anyway what i was going to say is as i listen to what you just said to rob and that story of the uh of the chapel and so on i mean i i just wish we'd look for our real life now like not our best life right yeah. that we, we, you know we have our real life not some life not an instagram life or a facebook life or a twitter life or any of those things that we do because we all play a role at some point right That's so right. but but that real real life and mm-hmm. it, you conclude this book with a story about unfinished masterpieces and yeah. um uh, and i wonder if you can share a little bit about how all of us are a work unfinished you know sure. we're, we're real and, and we're, we're, we're our masterpieces of ourselves. We're ridiculous masterpieces. <laughs> you know, I've, my friend likes to quote John Caputo, who talks about uh, we're impossible people who are seduced by an impossible God. Right. Mm, so, yeah. you know, so uh, can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, I was in um, my, my, both my parents are professors at the University of Manitoba. Oh God, what and, a beautiful uh, place. Just a gorgeous factory of learning. <laughs> well, and um, their, their logo, <laughs> their, their coat of arms has a snake on each side. That's right. <laughs> two two yes. snakes on each side, and I'm not going <laughs> to tell you what they're doing. <laughs> Call one all woman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Manitoba. Please send all your letters to Rob. Oh my gosh, can I just <laughs> send all your letters to Rob? Um, I just love that. So calling all their friends is the most upsetting thing anyone has ever <laughs> said about snakes. Um I was uh I was 
with my parents, my dad in particular, walking through this uh, cathedral in Portugal. And uh, it had, it was in this, um, it was, a, it was a cathedral built during the high watermark of a particular kind of architectural style <laughs> that has just sort of a, um, just like a real commitment to doodly dads, just like, <laughs> just like, just whirly whirl and then arches and then like just kind of an explosion of pineapples just stone <laughs> pineapples on everything and I was like my dad and I are looking at it, trying to be respectful and I look over and I was like hey dad what do you what do you think and he's got his arms crossed he's like oh horrible isn't it <laughs> and it, is, it really was and um we were looking at this beautiful like the you know, the, the, the majesty of a church that has been endlessly and excessively ornamented. Mm -hmm. And we met this man who was just walking around. So just thrilled. Mm -hmm. I mean, marveling around every corner and he kept just saying, Oh, wonderful. Yes. Which abs absolutely delightful, isn't it? And then <laughs> to my dad, I paused to be respectful and, um, and, uh, and at that moment, I realized that uh, what I thought was just a sh just a random shadow crossed the ground. And I realized when I looked up that the entire ceiling of the cathedral was entirely missing. And it turns mm -hmm. out that the kings had just kept building and ornamenting and building and ornamenting and just never finished it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that kingdoms had risen and fallen mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was never done. And this adorable old man who was walking around said, oh, what an incredible what an incredible vision of the life of faith. It's, 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 it's over before it's ever done. Isn't it? Mm. Aren't we all just, isn't it entirely unfinished? And I thought, what a beautiful, what a beautiful way of thinking about the way that we live knowing of course, that we are never, ever done. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. And that's, I guess it comes right back to that, that feeling I first had when I saw my kid mm. was there, yeah. well, this will never be done. Yeah. I don't have a single imagination for love that could ever allow this to be done. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. Kate, you are such a gift Fantastic. to us. And, uh, and, and so many people are going to be moved and transformed by, by your work and your witness. Um, we want to encourage everybody to find uh, no cure for being human. And uh, it's out today, folks. So you can find it. At your local bookstore, maybe with a yeah, with a Tim Hortons mug next to it. Get yourself a Tim. Mind you, where Kate's from. Get so. yourself a Tim's. Yeah. I love you guys. I really do. This has been yeah. absolutely wonderful. Thank well, you. Thank you so much. We, it wouldn't be right if we didn't do a shout out to Donna, who's Ian's mm. mom. That's and right. uh, uh, Donna, we thank you for your love for uh, for our our guest Kate Bowler, and we pray that you have the opportunity to discuss with your son about priorities when it comes to time <laughs> it's life choices and, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, today <laughs> and and donna's friend shannon honesberger was at a, she's in our education for ministry group we did last night and she's just she can't she's like when does it come out when i, I need to know when the thing with kate is coming out and she's like oh and I, I said look the book will be out on tuesday the podcast will be out on tuesday just everybody can stay calm this so so thrilled and i want to say a thank you to random house and to you uh, Kate, mm -hmm. for including us in today, because this is a special day, this book launch day, and uh, getting these books out to us. Uh, what a what a thrill! You're, Guys, you're like, you you're let awesome. me say orgy on your podcast. I it's know it's been a beautiful day. It's I've been always, a beautiful day, and you're it, officially it, welcomed back to the podcast. Absolutely. Now, so. so I, I, you know, when I was dreaming of what this will be like, I gotta <laughs> say I didn't think we'd be talking <laughs> it was about this. orgies. It was absolutely <laughs> this. Orgies, yeah, <laughs> on top of the list, really. You know, but you That's know, great. there's no cure for being human. There's no cure at all. <laughs> but uh, hey, Kate, God bless you. Thank, thanks so much. We love you, and uh, we look forward dears. to talking to you soon. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, guys. Bless you. All right. Thanks again to uh, Kate Bowler for joining us today. And we so look forward to uh, everybody picking up her book. It's out today. No Cure for Being Human and Other Truths I Need to Hear. That was fantastic. Yes. Guys, that was uh, good. Good podcast today. And uh, we've got more coming up for our listeners. We do indeed. In shortly. fact, we have another book launch special next week with Philip Yancey. Uh, mm. We'll be talking about his uh, uh, to be released next week memoir, his first memoir. Mm -hmm. um so and uh the publisher reached out to us and asked us to have him on and we're glad to do that so watch mm -hmm. for that in the meantime you podcast listeners get on over to kate's podcast which is called everything happens for a reason scratched out because she doesn't yeah. like that saying 
Yeah. And if, if you haven't seen her TED talk, uh, yes. look for that too on YouTube. It's yeah. fantastic. So bring your tissues. Yeah, yeah. Bring your tissues. You'll need them. All right, guys. Thanks again uh, to you and to our sponsors, of course, who make it all possible here in the Vickers Crossing to a Miller George funeral home where each life is celebrated and their sister company cremation, London, Middlesex, both family owned and operated to Hyde Park care pharmacy, Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, locally owned, locally operated, and locally loved. And to Molly Maid, make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. And I'm Rob Henderson from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's. Go Canada. I'm Kevin George from uh, St. Aidan's Church. And my name is Ian. Thank you for listening. And Kevin, remember, my friend, to always look both ways. Before you cross the street. And, and watch, watch for the snakes. And keep your stick on the ice. Thank you for listening. Our hosts are Kevin George and Rob Henderson. Our producer and composer is myself, Ian, with original artwork done by Elizabeth Dodman. If you have any questions or want to know where to find us, tweet us at Vickers Crossing or find us on Facebook at The Vickers Crossing. If you have any other questions about anything heard on this podcast, leave us a comment or look in the description to find out more. Thanks! Thanks!